Welcome back to Winning Isn't Easy. Sometimes court cases read like mystery stories, sometimes they read like fairy tales, and sometimes they read like horror stories. I'm going to tell you a little bit about both. First, I'm going to start out with the horror story of what one federal judge did about a short-term disability carrier's last-minute denial of benefits because the treating physician didn't respond to a call from the carrier's liar-for-hire peer review provider. So let's talk about the ERISA regulations. They require that if the disability carrier's peer review liar-for-hire doctor disagrees, and they generally do, with or wants clarification always from the treating physician, that the peer review doctor should reach out to the treating physician. And so one of the new denial games that disability carriers play is to have their liar for hire peer review doctor opine that you can really work. And then they send their peer review report to the treating physician for comment. If the treating physician doesn't respond, the carrier will treat their silence as an agreement that you can work, despite the fact that your doctor may have filled out a million um, attending physician statement forms that assign restrictions and limitations that preclude you from working. And so the carrier will say, gotcha. This is becoming a weapon. And unfortunately, not all the courts are recognizing that it's become a weapon. For example, there's this awful case called Griffin versus Charter Communications. It's a case out of North Carolina. And Griffin was disabled because of a psychiatric impairment and hypertension. The claims administrator for the short-term disability plan had their plan peer review liar for hire doctors reach out to the treating physician to satisfy their plan duty to retrieve and consider relevant information. Unfortunately, Griffin's treating doctor was contacted six times over several days and just didn't respond. Now, despite the fact that the administrator never told Griffin that they were reaching out, that the contacts had been unsuccessful, the court said that the plan administrator's contacts were enough to satisfy its burden and they upheld the denial of the claim. Now, that's not only just wrong, it's crappy. The lessons that I learned from a case like that is that I think that the policyholder should be sent a letter, uh, or should send a letter rather, to the carrier saying, you can't call my treating physician. And I am gonna put you on notice that any request for information or clarification has to be put in writing with a copy of that request to me, and if I'm represented, to my attorney. And I wanna put the doctor on notice that they should not respond to any request unless it's in writing and I'm copied with it. And I want to send a, in my letter to the carrier uh, a paragraph that says, look, you're on notice that if you're reaching out for more information and you don't get a response, that you have an obligation to notify me and I will deal with a treating physician and I will intervene and I will get you whatever it is you want. And I want you to hold up that decision until we can help you clarify any questions you have or get any additional information. I don't want the disability carrier to game this ERISA regulation. Um, and I think that it's unfortunate that Griffin lost her case, but those were some lessons that uh, I've learned and lessons that have changed the way I handled this particular issue. Now, I want to contrast that with an Alabama court who rejected uh, the United of Omaha's request for comment and denied the claim because the treating physician didn't respond. Now, unfortunately, this case uh, reflects uh, the problems that we have in ERISA and the lack of uniformity in how courts apply um, ERISA rules, ERISA regulations, and ERISA case law. But let me tell you the fairy tale of Wiley versus United Omaha Life Insurance Company, which is, as I said, a case out of Alabama. 
Wiley was a senior business analyst and could not maintain attention and concentration to do analytical skills on a sustained basis. And this was corroborated by his physicians, by objective medical testing, multiple spinal surgeries, uh, and continued significant post-operative problems. Yet, of course, United of Omaha's liar for hire peer review providers concluded he could work. And they sent their peer review liar for hire reports to Wiley's treating physicians asking, do you agree with my conclusions that he could perform his occupational duties as a senior business analyst? Those physicians didn't respond and the United of Omaha attempted to weaponize the lack of response as a justification for the claims denial. And when Wiley sued, the court said, not only not so fast, but outlined in a 56 page decision with an extensive appendix to the administrative record that the court created on its own, a detailed chronology of the medical facts of the case that outlined the significance of Wiley's problems, not only prior to surgery, but postoperatively. And the court said, look, we're not going to take the treating physician's lack of response uh, seriously, we're going to afford it little weight, and we don't think that it's sufficient to ignore the reams of medical evidence that support this claim. And in a quote that I love to use in my appeals, the court said, ignoring the breadth and depth of such objective evidence allows insurance companies to subvert meritorious claims by simply increasing the paperwork burden on a claimant physician. Now, obviously, this result differed from the unfortunate decision uh, that we've talked about. And that's unfortunate because the result's going to depend on where you live and the way the courts in your area address the issue. And I think that's, again, one of the reasons why you need an experienced ar ERISA attorney, because the law may be the same, but the courts interpret it differently uh, in not only uh, every circuit, but within the district courts of each circuit. But I want to give a shout out to um, Wiley's doctors and um, all the doctors who fill out attending physician statement forms and have to put up the carrier's harassment. I think that they're the true heroes of the long-term disability claims. And I hate the way the disability carriers try to paint these doctors um, in a corner by continuing to dump paperwork on them and asking them to, to agree or disagree with a liar for hire peer review doctors when the treating physician has filled out multitudes of uh, forms on behalf of the uh, the policyholder. So again, that's why I think it's crucial that your doctor be one who's willing to put up with his crap and who will support your claim throughout the life of the claim. When we come back, I'm going to uh, wrap up this podcast. Well, that's a wrap. We've talked today about uh, what you should do if your short-term disability insurance claim has been denied or your benefits have been cut off before you've been paid all your benefits. We've busted some myths. And I've told you some stories about how disability insurance carriers are trying to, to weaponize a treating physician's failure to respond to calls or contact. I want to remind you that I do take questions and uh, I enjoy answering questions uh, that I get from uh, people every day in my practice because I think you need to understand the games and what you need to do to get the disability benefits you deserve. So don't forget uh, to comment and give us your questions. Take care. Talk to you next week.